Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this joint hearing, this workshop actually, together with the Petitions Committee for which I'm Chair and the Legal Affairs Committee. Together we will address a very delicate issue, namely adoption, cross-border legal issues. And you have the, the program in front of you. It's a very interesting one, so I really... I hope that and look forward to a very fruitful afternoon together with you. The Petitions Committee has received uh, during the past few years a lot of petitions related to international adoptions. And even if the number has remained relatively low, they anyway do highlight very concrete problems faced by the EU citizens that are facing international adoptions. The Commission has replied that it does not consider specific European rules on the recognition of international adoption to be necessary, as all EU member states are parties to the 1993 Hague Convention, which states, states in its Article 23 that an adoption uh, certified by the competent authorities of the state of the adoption as having been made in accordance with the Convention shall be recognized by operation of law in the other contracting states. But, and but, and but again, the actual implementation of this Convention is a matter under the competence of the member states and it seems that some of them are not complying with it and this situation leads sometimes to breach of the freedom of movement and practical difficulties for the EU citizens and for the adopted children. So this underlines the importance of the discussions during this workshop. And, and we will now, we will now um, give open also this, this, uh, this session by, by Tadeusz Swiewka, who is the Vice Chair of, of the Legal Affairs Committee. Dzień dobry Państwu. Jest mi niezmiernie miło, że, że wspólnie z Cecilią Wikström. Thank you. It's a pleasure to open today's workshop with Mrs. Wikström. and I will be chairing the second panel meeting. As uh, Cecilia has just said, this is one of the most important international subjects that we're going to be talking about today because it affects the most vulnerable people in the world and we need to take care of these people. We're talking about children, of course. Adoption is a complex and complicated issue. When I look at today's agenda, uh, I can see that the subjects that are going to be addressed by our speakers show what a broad-ranging issue this is. We're going to look at cross-border adoption as, as well as national adoption systems. We're also going to talk about international adoption with reference to uh, the signatures of the Hague Convention and we're also going to talk about adoption in countries that haven't signed up to the 1993 Hague in Convention. So I think we can say that we're going to be dealing with a very vast subject today. Today's debate, today's discussions uh, will provide considerable added value. As shadow rapporteur, I'm going to be looking at the legal aspects of international adoption. This is an own initiative report, and I think today's debate and today's discussions will help me with this opinion and a lot of what is said today will be reflected in the own initiative report or initiative opinion 
which is going to be drafted. We're also working on the uh, Brussels 2 regulation. We're looking at issues of family codes and custody of children. And despite the existence of the Hague Convention, international solutions have proved insufficient. There are lots of areas where progress can be made in order Thank you very, to very much. better Thank you. You meet the needs of children. Why was the why was adoption created? This instrument is not there to help adults to adopt children. The aim is to improve the conditions of the most vulnerable people in this world, i.e. children who need the help of adults. So I think we have to be aware of our responsibility in this area. I hope we're going to have a fruitful debate. I'm now going to hand over to Mrs. McGuinness, who is uh, one of our vice presidents. Both who have introduced this topic for this afternoon, adoption, cross-border legal issues, it is an issue which, in my role as children's uh, rights mediator in cases of child abduction, comes across our desk in the office. And clearly it isn't within our remit, but we are sensitive and mindful of citizens' concerns on it. So I'm very honoured to be asked to chair this particular uh, part of proceedings and to thank both petitions and the Legal Affairs Committee for their diligence on this issue um, and our cooperation has been excellent uh, on it. And that is only right. Um, I'm mindful of your uh, very concluding remarks that this is about the most vulnerable. Their voices uh, have got to be heard and we are the ones who are um, I, I suppose empowered to do that so it is very important that we do a, that in a correct way um, we will now hear from um, three different speakers um, Madam Wickstrom again then Sir Matthew Thorpe and Mr Yarosh all of different backgrounds and interests in this issue I'll introduce each in turn but I want firstly to turn to the chair of the petitions committee again because you had a very important fact finding mission uh, to the United Kingdom and I think it will be helpful for colleagues here to hear how that went and your findings uh, from your fact-finding mission. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much and uh, I'm happy to share with you the experiences that we as a committee uh, uh, met in, in London. Um, the fact-finding visit was organized a few months ago and actually took place place only a few weeks ago. Uh, I will not on this occasion talk about the difficulties to obtain recognition for an adoption, but on the contrary, about the difficulties faced by parents when they do not want their child to be adopted. I'll come back to that in a moment. Let me share with you our situation in the petitions committee. We have received approximately 20 petitions related to cases of children that have been taken into public care in England and in Wales uh, and subsequently be play, being placed for adoption without the consent of the biological parents. That's why we, we label those as non-consensual non adoptions or even sometimes forced adoptions. According to the authorities, the consent has been dispensed with the, in the best in, interest of the child. And this is, of course, crucial. Whenever we discuss child welfare issues, we must always ensure that we act in the best interest of the child. This should always be our main focus. So the best solution for the child may differ individually from case to case. 
However, it should be noticed that an adoption order of this kind is irreversible. There is no way back. It seems that recently there has been an increase in the numbers of cases involving non-UK parents, mainly families from Eastern Europe, countries such as Slovakia, Latvia and Bulgaria. And the transborder aspect makes the Petitions Committee competent to examine these petitions. They are not only national, they are cross-border. So that's why they fall under our competences. So as a first step, we invited to the committee some of, of the petitioners to present their petition to the members of the full committee. To learn more about the situation, we also commissioned a report to the policy department, and it was presented to us by its author, Dr. Claire fenton Glynn from the Cambridge University. I recommend those interested in this particular issue to read the report. It has been highly appreciated, not only by us in the Petitions Committee, but also by the experts that we met in London, and they made references to this report many, many times. Additionally, a report of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe was published in September this year. It also raises some concerns about the situation in the UK. So, the idea of a fact-finding visit emerged. We aimed at exchanging with the relevant practitioners and stakeholders to get a balanced and accurate view on the issues raised by the petitioners and at learning more about the whole social and legal system in England and in Wales. The delegation was composed of eight MEPs and the visit was very short, but terrifically efficient, I must say, very well organized by our, our Secretariat. And we had the opportunity to meet with a wide range of experts who all openly shared their experiences and, and, and position. We met social workers, journalists, representatives of associations offering legal, psychological and practical support to the parents and the children involved in care proceedings, representatives of the police services, the Right Honourable Sir James Munby, the Head of Family Justice in England and Wales, representatives also of Bulgarian and Latvian diplomatic services in the UK, lawyers specialised in family law, and also two MEPs, two MPs who campaign in favour of the rights of families in the UK and Wales, England and Wales. To start, I should say something about statistics. Access to relevant statistics is difficult since the collected data do not indicate the nationality of the parents. So we don't really have the absolute exact idea of the scope of the problems with transnational aspects. But one thing we do know for sure, and that is that the UK is unique in Europe in permitting the social severance of family ties without parental consent. It is not the non-consensual adoption in itself which is unusual, but more the frequency of its use, and especially the speed of the process. The level of domestic adoption in the other member states tend to be low and there are legal barriers to adoption without parental consent and it is very rarely used in practice. So all of the meetings that we have had were interesting. We learned a lot of the le on the legal system, on the practices of the social services and the charities involved in care proceedings. But I would also like to tell, tell you more in detail something about what was said by Sir James Munby. Um, he is famous in the UK as the successor of Sir Matthew Thorpe, who, will be, uh, who we will, will listen to later this afternoon. Uh, and he has been quite um, 
widely quoted for his recent judgment where he does not hesitate to criticize the judicial and social services practices in family matters and establish the legal principles and practical guidelines which must be followed by both the social services and the family law judges. He considers that there have been too often in the UK a failure to comply with, with the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations from 1963, and that in every case with a foreign element, including but not limited to Europe, the relevant consular authorities must be informed at the outset, unless the foreign family involved says no or gives its consent. As a matter of consequences, if some foreign representatives, as a consular matter, want to be present in court, then they should be allowed to, un to unless there are some very good reasons to ask for the contrary. Sir James also mentioned the importance of having Article 15 of the Brussels 2A regulation, which allow a national court to transfer the proceedings to a court in another member state, taking right at the beginning of the care proceedings. According to him, this article is used much more often in the courts of England and Wales than in the courts of the rest of the EU. So, finally, one issue that he insisted on, and which is essential in a European context, and more especially in family law matters, is the respect of the cultural dimension. If uh, he does not want to challenge the resort to non-consensual adoptions in, in some very difficult situations in the best interest of the child, he nevertheless estimates that and I'm quoting him now, the approach both of the witness and of the judge must be rigorous, analytical, and properly reasoned, never forgetting that adoption is permissible only as a last resort and only if a comprehensive analysis of the child's circumstances in every aspect, including the child's national, cultural, linguistic, ethnic, and religious background leads the court to the conclusion that the overriding requirements of the child's welfare justify adoption. End of quotation. And finally, Sir James estimates that things are moving and believes that most of the shortcomings we have just mentioned should be matters of the past in a relatively short future. As a personal remark, I agree that we need to focus on the welfare of the child. I believe that in most cases this implies that the society should try to help as far as possible families to stay together. Children should, as far as possible, be allowed to have a relationship with their parents and a link to their cultural, religious, linguistic heritage. It seemed at first sight that we were facing irreconcilable positions, but thanks to these various exchanges that we had, we have a much clearer view on the interests and the problems of all the parties involved now, and we all hope to end up with some achievable proposals. Now, my committee is working on the draft report from the delegation visit, and I'm confident that we will manage to produce a balanced and valuable working document of interest to anybody who wants to look deeper into this subject matter. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, uh, Madam Wikström, for the findings of your study. It is encouraging that when you engage with people, there's a better understanding. So I'm looking forward to the report. But you did raise some very serious issues which we will deal with in our discussion. So let me just now introduce our next speaker who has already been mentioned by Madam Wikström, and that is the Right Honourable Sir Matthew Thorpe. 
um, former head of International Family Justice for England and Wales. And I had the great pleasure of meeting Sir Matthew again in London at a hearing uh, around this issue of children in care and cross-border dimensions. And we're very pleased, uh, Sir Matthew, that you could come to the European Parliament uh, and to share with us your vast experience in this area of international movement of children and also to hear some of your recommendations on the way forward. The heading of your talk is Child Protection, Tensions Created by the Diversity of the Domestic Laws of EU Member States. So you have the floor, floor sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marid. Uh, I, I would like to reciprocate by expressing my pleasure at uh, having the opportunity to put my point of view to this workshop. Uh, my judicial experience uh, could be said to have tainted me uh, into the orthodox English-Welsh tradition. Uh, all my professional life I have been a family lawyer in London and in the last eight years of my career I was head of international family justice for England and Wales and it was in that role that I encountered the problem that we discussed this afternoon with a, an appeal brought by a Slovak grandmother from an adoption order that had been made in the trial court. She was fully supported by the Slovak Republic who had obtained party status in the appeal and were represented by the director of the of, of the central authority. Uh, the, the hearing of an appeal of that sort has a strong emotional impact on the members of the court, and we were three. Two family specialists, myself and my successor, and a non-family member of the court, and we divided. The family specialists were divided. And we had the case three times within a space of three weeks, immediately before Christmas 2013. And in the end, the non-family member of the court shared my point of view, and those two boys went back to Slovakia. Uh, they are actually the case referred to in paragraph 323 of the Fenton Glynn study. I retired in July 2013 and took up a new career as an independent consultant. In that role I was consulted by Poland on precisely this problem and had meetings with the Polish Minister of Justice. I was also consulted by Bulgaria in the Megan Pavey case, also referred to in the Fenton Glynn study. But it is my work with Slovakia that has given me a proper perception of both sides of the divide. I have acted as standing consultant to the Ministry of Labour for over a year now. And in Slovakia, I have co-organized the annual international family law conferences. I've given evidence to the parliamentary committee in Bratislava, and I have given frequent media interviews in London, acting in the same capacity as consultant, I co-organized the May 14th seminar that our chairman introduced, and I have organized an alliance of the consular departments of the 10 
accession states, as I will call them, the states from the Baltic through to the Balkans. I have arranged meetings of those consular representatives with the Ministry of Justice, I'm sorry, the Ministry of Education, which is the lead ministry for drafting guidelines for the management of children who are not nationals, uh, not British nationals, but nationals of another member state. I have facilitated the negotiation of the Peterborough Memorandum of Understanding to which I will come. So in consequence, I have acquired, since I retired, I think greater objectivity and an enhanced appreciation of the need for communication and collaboration in this difficult field. The Fenton Glynn study was delivered in June 2015, and I would just like to echo uh, the commendation which it has already received. It is full, it is comprehensive, and it is completely reliable, in my opinion. So, in a sense, what can I add? to what Dr. Fenton Glynn has written. I think what I can add are three subsequent developments. On the 2nd of November, a government statement was reported in the Times and all other newspapers to the effect that distant relatives will be disqualified from looking after children who could be adopted instead in an attempt to tackle the plummeting number of youngsters being found permanent new families. That is a quotation from the news page, the news report, of the Prime Minister's statement of policy intention. But I also want to draw attention to the leader in the newspaper on that day. There was a time when the Times leaders were read universally as the voice of wisdom. They may not carry the same respect nowadays, but the writer of the leader dealing with this government announcement said, and this is a quotation, in future any relative seeking to adopt a child must show an existing strong bond with them. Social workers and courts will also have to be satisfied that relatives are totally committed to the children. This is an overdue victory for humanity and common sense. Adoption is necessarily sensitive and often fraught. It should not be further hampered by social experimentation, voguish politics, or mistaken judges. It is the child's life at stake. Now, behind this, you will see a clear tension between the executive and the judiciary. With this particular newspaper running a campaign that it says has found fulfillment in the Prime Minister's statement. But the reality, as touched on by Dr. Fenton Glynn, is that the judicial pronouncements in the case of B.S., led to a halving of the number of children that were placed for adoption because in that judgment the president introduced the concept of nothing less will do. An adoption order can only be made as a matter of discretion when nothing less will do. Consequence, the number of children going to adoption halves. 
What is the government response? It's the Prime Minister's statement. So you see a tension between the policy direction of the judiciary and the policy direction of the government. And I would only offer this view that the government's policy objective is rationally supportable, providing it is seen as a policy restricted to English national children. What I think we need to have a clear distinct, we, we need always to draw a clear distinction between a policy applied to English national children who come into the care system and children who are nationals of some other member state. And for them, we need the clear guidance that the President has given, Sir James Mumby has given, in this triad of cases, re E in January 2014, uh, re C B in August 2015, and now I come to the second important development since the Fenton Glen study, and that is the decision of the Court of Appeal in the case of Re-N, which coincidentally was handed down on the same day as the government statement. And in Re-N, the President is emphatically bringing together the guidance in the two earlier cases, and as the Chairman has said, stressed once again the importance of and ethnicity, language, culture on any discretionary decision as to the future placement of children who are nationals of some other member state. So we have this tension because in our system, unlike in many civil law systems, there is a wide discretion given to the judges to develop the statutory law. The black law comes from Parliament, but the judges exercise their discretion in formulating how it should be applied. The last point I make in relation to post-Fenton Glynn study developments is the Peterborough Memorandum of Understanding. And this, I think, may have a significant future importance. It is an agreement negotiated between the Slovak Ministry and an individual English local authority, Peterborough Council. Why Peterborough? Because there is a heavy concentration of Slovaks who are working in the uh, agriculture and horticultural uh, intensity that surrounds the city and, and they uh, are matched by a large number of Latvians and Portuguese. But because of this, the local authority in Peterborough has developed particular expertise in dealing with Slovak families so have the schools, so have the medical health uh, services. So Peterborough really understands Slovak people. And it seemed just a natural that there should be a clear contract between the Slovak state and the English local authority for cooperation, co collaboration in any cases that involve Slovak national children. And what I would suggest is that this is something which could, I don't say it will, but which could grow. It could be replicated by other member states and it could be replicated in other local authority areas. It has given a great deal of confidence to the Slovak ministry that they now have the benefit of a clear agreement for collaboration and exchange of information and it has given confidence to the professionals in Peterborough who feel that they now have a strong working relationship 
with the relevant ministry. So I would like to end where I almost started by saying that the one thing that I think I have learned from uh, the work I have been doing in this field is that everything depends upon communication. We have to communicate to better understand each other, to better understand our law, to better understand our policies, to better understand our practices. And I think that that has borne fruit. I think that there's no doubt at all that when England was first faced with the problem of uh, children, nationals of another member state who were falling into the care system, the protection system, they weren't very clever at dealing with them. They were too insular in their approach. They were insufficiently sensitive to the culture, language, ethnicity points. But that has really changed now. And also what has changed is the involvement of the consular departments who get early notice of any relevant case. The problem now for the consular departments is not insufficiency of notice, but in covering the number of cases notified to them with the resources that they have in the consular department. They have maybe on any one day three cases, 100 miles 50 miles apart. They just don't have the staff to cover all the cases. And in, in conversation with the consular uh, corps uh, last month to the question, have things improved? Are they better now than they used to be? They all unanimously said, yes, of course they are. So I think if, if we have in the past transgressed, I think we have learned from our transgressions, and I think that if we continue this process of, of communication and collaboration, uh, we will be achieving, uh, we will be doing good for the children. Thank you. And thank you very much, and I think your last sentence really gives us encouragement about doing good by the children. I think that's the key uh, remark. And the idea of communication being vital, I think that's true in life generally, but particularly so in this very sensitive issue. So thank you for your insights, uh, uh, matched with experience. Um, I now move to our next speaker, after which we'll have a discussion, and I know colleagues want to get involved, so please indicate. Uh, we will hear now from the former Children's Ombudsman for Poland, Mr. Jarosz. Um, and his paper is The View of Ombudsman for Children from the Perspective of the Polish, European and International Law. And just to give you some background uh, to our next contributor, um, it comes from uh, the District Court Judge of Warsaw, also a lecturer um, at university, a former Ombudsman for Children in Poland, and President of the European Network of Ombudsmen for Children. So vast experience in this issue. So I now invite you to make your presentation, Mr. Jarosz. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen members of the European Parliament and experts. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for holding this uh, meeting, this workshop which I think will very, be very uh, good for children. I'd like to uh, bring a couple of points to your attention just to start off. May I set out my point of view? not so much as Ombudsman for Children's Rights, but as a judge. Dealing with uh, family affairs, amongst others, in Poland. I listened to Mr Thorpe's words with uh, great interest just now. He used a number of examples regarding... Uh, cross-border adoption, Slovakia and the UK in this case. I haven't had that kind of experience in my own working life. I haven't uh, studied that kind of case. 
So I'd just like to tell you about my experience as a mediator for childhood as well as a judge. I'd like to talk about international law on international adoption in Poland as well as the international conventions and European law. There are three ideas here which I think are important and they are central to international adoptions. Firstly, residence of the child and the best interest of the child and then children's rights which are very important the child's right to justice in Poland it's very important for us to hear from the child in everything that is important According to Article 114 of the Code of the Family in Poland, an adoption that leads to a change of residence to a different country, that can only occur in such a case that the child has an adequate replacement family in the other country. That provision has been in place since 1995 when Poland was already a signatory to the convention but then there's the 1993 Hague Convention which came into force only in uh, September 1996 so according to Article 2 of the Hague Convention that applies if and when the child resides in one country and then is taken to another country following adoption or in either in in his country of origin or in a host country and uh, the standards of the convention apply to signatory countries to the convention and there are many countries that fall into that category so the convention can be almost uh, considered universal I'd like to re return to article 114 in Polish law where there is a distinction between the place where the child resides and uh, place of uh, place of residence and uh, these problems arise quite often in family law in european law we've got regulation 220 of 2011 concerning family responsibility and basically this is Brussels 210 that idea comes up in private law into international law in the Hague Convention now in the Convention of the 1st of January uh, 1977 that uh, comes up in in 1980 as well uh, these civil aspects regarding the child moving arise as well and in the convention of uh, 61 and oct that of October 1999 regarding the implementation of decisions that fall under uh, parental responsibility so to return to the civil code of 2008 then the pla place of 
uh, a, pla a place of habitual residence comes up. That comes up in issues regarding divorce. That's in Article 41 as well. As well as uh, the new law under the International Convention. But uh, this problem regarding residence isn't defined in most of the documents. This place of residence is the place where all the child's activities are carried out. So it's a, a, a factual place. It's an actual place where things take place. There have been attempts to try and find a de definition in the ECJ's uh, decisions in 2009. There is talk of this place of residence uh, in Article 8 of Re uh, Regulation 2001-2003, the place of residence is the place where the child can become integrated into his environment and with the family. But there are also certain legal uh, requirements such as nationality, knowledge of language, the place where the child goes to school, the, and the national court needs to define the place of residence, bearing in mind all these essential elements. The Supreme Polish Court has also spoken out about this and according in accordance with the article of the Hague Convention where it talks about the stable place of residence of a child being a place where all his or her needs are met whereas The place of residence is not decided, not decided upon by the the, the child, the the guardians of the child. Now, Article One One Four uh, in Poland, uh, when that came into force, the convention standards took priority over the Polish fam family. Um, convention standards and in agreement with the Polish convention sorry with the according to the Polish con constitution those conventions signed take priority over the provisions of national law in the Hague convention it talks about subsidiarity and that's much more flexible than in Article 114 of Polish law. Much more flexible than the uh, rights of the child agreement. Now, Article 4 of the Convention says that adoption can take place when the bodies of the country in question have decided that uh, international adoption is in the best interest of the child and that allows for international adoption to take place when it's in the interest of the child even if it would be possible for the child to be lodged in their country of origin. This principle of subsidiarity It comes up in all of these documents. But this allows for the following interpretation. Even if the child can be adopted in, the, in his or her country of origin, 
it may well be in their interest to find a better environment abroad for family reasons. We have analysed four adoption centres. There are four centres where uh, applications for adoption can be submitted. According to Article 4 of the Convention, adoption can take place when the uh, bodies from the country of origin believe that all conditions have been met in agreement with Article 5 of the Hague Convention, adoption can take place if the host country sees that the child can be adopted and if it is seen that the child can enter and stay in the host country. Chapter 4 of the Hague Convention is for the central institutions, but quite often there are indications regarding the institutions concerned whereby they're given the possibility to turn to the central institutions of the country of uh, residence. So according to that principle, we will point out that during the procedure, you need to bear in mind the child's opinion, taking into account the age and maturity of the child. And uh, there, there's just one point that uh, uh, that occurs to me as a judge and mediator. Uh, one of the laws that is uh, little respected in the EU, that is the right for the child to be heard. And if you look through all the provisions that I've talked about, you need to take into account the child's opinion according to how old and mature the child is. But what does that actually mean? Well, it means that firstly, the child needs to be heard. But if he or she isn't heard, then how do you uh, take the child's opinion into account? If you take into account the child's opinion, you need to look at everything, such as age and maturity, <coughs> as I say, uh, their state of health. But, You can't stop the child from being heard just for one of those reasons. The injustice here isn't to do with the procedure. What's unjust here is the absence of procedure. If the child cannot utilise this right, then there will be conflict. The conflict arises... Uh, when we go against human rights. So, I think that, as uh, Judge Thorpe says, everything depends on communication. Good communication uh, leads to better understanding. In Polish, we, uh, we uh, say, uh, yes, words are holy, but what we need is in those countries that are signatories of the Convention on uh, the Rights of the Child, all of these provisions need to be pinned down on the ground uh, in the best interest of the child. Thank you. And thank you very much, um, particularly your um, focus on listening to the voice of the child, because this is an issue that is different in across the member states 
there are different systems in place and in some places there are no systems to listen to the voice of the child. So I think you've raised a very important issue and equally you have reinforced the point around communication. So I'm going to open the floor now and give our first remark or question to Mr. Wojciechowski and if other colleagues would like to uh, indicate we can take their points. Thank you. Dziękuję bardzo pani przewodnicząca. Dziękuję bardzo za zorganizowanie tej Thank you chairman, madam chairman. Thank you for organizing this workshop. And also I'd like to thank you for uh, organizing the visit to London. I was there and all of the meetings in London were very good. It was very good to uh, listen to Mr. Thorpe and to Mr. Yarosh. I have worked uh, with Mr. Yarosh when he was uh, a judge and when he was parliamentarian. I think both of the presentations were very interesting and I would just like to pick up on what they said. We're talking about situations here that affect children, the rights of children and human rights in a very drastic manner. We're talking about situations, tragic human situations very often. Forced adoptions against the will of the parents and the children, not taking account uh, of the will of children is a real tragedy. And this leads to families being split up, you know, whole families being split up. Recently, I, I saw a document, two documentaries on the same day in Poland, on Polish TV. One dealt with the case of two, con uh, two brothers uh, who were reunited at the age of 70. They had been separated during the Second World War. They'd been looking for each other for decades. One lived in the United States, the other in Poland, and they were reunited. And we saw that there was a great deal of emotion when uh, these two brothers met at an airport in Poland uh, because it had taken them so long to find each other. And then second documentary related to a, a young woman who was looking for her brother. They had been separated when they were children she only had a vague memory of her brother who had been taken away from her, had been uh, given up for adoption. We don't know which uh, court gave him up for adoption. The, the woman w w had been looking for her brother, but she couldn't get any information. She didn't know what had happened to him because when someone is put up for adoption, then all family ties uh, with the biological family are broken. So the woman didn't know whether the brother was in, uh, uh, in Poland, whether he was still living or not. So I watched these two documentaries and I thought, well, this is really inhumane. The, these young people separated uh, by war and uh, uh, they can be reunited. That, that's okay, but then when a judge decides this, then this is a real tragedy you know, separating, splitting up uh, brothers and sisters is just not right. And when it comes to adoption, I think we should make sure that brothers and sisters stay together because having brothers and sisters is a, is a gift from heaven. It, it is a tie that we shouldn't deprive anybody of. And I welcome the fact that Mr. Yaros emphasized the fact that children need to be heard and listened to. There are rights on paper. Even in the Polish constitution and in the various different laws, there are rights. But these rights are not all, always applied in practice. Maybe this is just a Polish issue. I don't know. 
I think that the child situation should be taken into account in all situations. The child must be listened to, and this right is inalienable. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for this discussion. I think we, it's come at a, a good time. We need to fight this problem. And what is happening increasingly to children in Europe is very dangerous. It's one of our major challenges for the future in the European Union. We need to have clear and humane rules uh, underpinning this area. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, the trip to London. Thank you for this discussion, and uh, I'm happy to see that there has been some progress made um, uh, as set out by uh, the Right Honourable Mr Thorpe. So I think things are heading in the right direction, and hopefully this will pay off and we will have better respect and compliance with children's rights and we'll deal with children more humane in the future. Contribution. Mr. Yar, you have a question or comment? Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the organisers of this workshop. I am coordinator in the Petitions Committee and our Chair, uh, Ms. Wigström, has already said that we're often overwhelmed by the petitions that come into us because they're about the rights and adoption of the of children. They're often uh, heartrending, and uh, we in the petitions committee are not a court and can only provide indirect help, but yet have to. Uh, so it's good to see the problem being uh, addressed uh, by the Committee of Legal Affairs so that we can move towards uh, European uh, legislation. But in the European Union, we have our internal market, for, and we've been very successful with the exchange of goods, but we're not so good, perhaps, with the exchange of people, because uh, people do move around the European Union. They're free to do so. They have to uh, get to know each other. They're allowed to uh, get to know each other, fall in love, get married, and so on. And that's where things often go wrong. And in my experience, that we have undervalued uh, this whole aspect here, the two. We have to give more attention to it. In uh, fact, a finding visit to Yolanda was very useful. There will also be similar missions to Berlin and Denmark. When you talk to the member states, they all have their own systems, and they're all very happy with their own systems. And their attitude has been, uh, we're happy with this, keep your hands off, this is working very well. And the Positions Committee, we get to see that it doesn't work because there's lots of complaints, and I'm very grateful uh, after this uh, fact-finding mission to London, with, uh, we met uh, people who were similarly minded. As the earlier speaker said, uh, we saw where, that, where the problems are. My suggestion and my question would be, as Mr. Silver correctly said, everything depends on, Mr. Thorpe said, well, everything depends on communication. It's my experience, too. I've always said in member states, you don't have to work against the system, but to fight within the system for your rights. But first you have to know how the system works in order to do that. So it's a communications problem. And uh, it's good when uh, embassies and consulates are involved in terms of adoption and so on. Which concern people from other uh, member states the question is, could we legislate more for this where communication can't uh, do the full job? Perhaps we can improve the legislation because, uh, but when you know the system, it's, you're better able to fight for your rights. What gave me food for thought in, in uh, England, England Wales, was 
that the uh, doctrine is that the uh, there's a child focus that they they want to put the child in a safe family and that leads to adoption which gives the child a whole new perspective because the original parents weren't able to care for the child. But uh, two things are uh, left out of uh, sight there, as an earlier speaker said, the interest of the child and the interest of the child must be uh, investigated more thoroughly. You have to hear the views of the child And what was of concern to me too was uh, in relation to the parents, perhaps it's being it's established a little bit too quickly that the parents are incapable of caring for the child. There could be a positive prognosis. Perhaps the circumstances will change in terms of the parents. Uh, their life circumstances will change. So you could have a positive prognosis things improve, but the child then has been adopted without consent and that can no longer be uh, revoked. So what obviously le what was often left out of uh, sight was that very often behind a child you have not only the parents but also other relatives, grandparents, and that wasn't taken into account either in this issue in terms of the interests of the child. The wider family, the grandparents and so on, weren't uh, included in the picture. And the question for me is how we can do this better. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Mr. Szwefka. Dziękuję. Ja dwa krótkie pytania chciałbym się odnieść do... Thank you. Just like to talk about judges' practices. You both talked about communication. You said that that played a key role. We're talking about cooperation and working together here. Do you think that cooperation between the various international institutions is sufficient in this area or not? Or is progress needed when it comes to cooperation and communication between the various different bodies? And then another question relating to your practical experience as judges. During your time as judges, what was the biggest problem you were faced with when you had to uh, hand down rulings on adoption. Thank you. Very much for those comments and questions. May I just add a few lines, if, if you will? Um, and in relation to the UK situation, Sir Matthew, just to try and extract, because the political statement recently about trying to, um, if you like, increase the flow of children through the care system more rapidly and into adoptions is quite a political statement on a social care system. Um, I'm wondering, is adoption being looked at as a cure for the care system rather than a good solution for the children? The second question relates to citizenship. I wasn't entirely clear if there are, um, you know, two different nationalities married in the UK with a child born in the UK. Do you refer to that child as a UK citizen or is it a citizen of the member state of origin of the parents and what impact that should have on decisions that are taken. I'm mindful that our chair of petition said that adoption is irreversible and do we give enough of a second chance to the parents as Peter Yar has pointed out and can this be done in a way where we're also mindful of the difficulties for the children. I gather there is another comment. I beg your pardon. Oh, Mrs. Devo, and then Madam uh, Bickstrom. Uh, merci, Madam Lap. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, my question may have already been answered. I've come in late, unfortunately. I uh, also believe that you need to ask the child's opinion, and I'd like to know whether, uh, according to your experience, there's an ideal age from which you can ask the child's uh, opinion. What kind of age uh, could you imagine there? Madam Wickstrom. Thank you. Well, actually, it was you that initiated my question. That, that is that 
the, the whole process of adoption is in, in, in the UK very quick if you compare to other, other member states. 26 weeks. 26 weeks as an average, which is very, very quickly. It's, not, it's only half a year. And if we are there to give a parent another chance to come back to get his life or her life sorted out in order to be able to take care of the child and take the child back, the, the, the vast majority of us would say that the UK system allows for a huge number of adoptions and they are being decided for and dealt with under a very, very quick procedure. Uh, when we were there, the Prime Minister came up public and he said, no, we have too few adoptions and the, de the decision is taken too quick, too uh, slowly. So in our view, those are two complete different angles, two different views, and it would be interesting to listen to, to the views of, of some of the experts on this. Thank you. I'm conscious of time, so... Sir Matthew, will you take the points that were specifically directed towards you? Thank you. Uh, judicial communication and collaboration in Europe, I would say, has improved dramatically as a result of the creation and enlargement of the International Judicial Hague Network so that every European member state now has a network judge and this system has been refined and developed. It works excellently well. I mean, for instance, Poland has uh, appointed a network judge late in the day but it has been hugely beneficial to us because we have a lot of Anglo-Polish cases. The experience of a judge who has to make an adoption order decision, of course it's agonizingly difficult work, but you are defended by your experience and probably defended by whatever strengths you have in your own family life, which helps you cope with the workload and the difficult decisions. Moving on to um, Myred's points, the policy of government, um, I think um, the Tension is well recognized in the Fenton Glen study. On the one hand, you want the best for children. And very often the best for children, depending on age and history and all that, is to give them a loving parent couple. Uh, the tension is that if the government puts that policy too insistently, are the other options for children within the range being neglected? Uh, and I, I think that point is well made by in the Fenton Glynn study. Uh, I think that it is a difference if there is a mixed marriage. Say there's an English mother and say that there is a Polish father, uh, maybe the marriage is broken down and this and that. In practice, uh, the emphasis on ethnicity, uh, language and all that will be uh, diminished because the child has probably br been brought up as an English speaker or best bilingual. Uh, I think that the 26, moving on to Madam Wickstrom's points, the 26 weeks is essentially for the care proceedings. And it was necessarily introduced in a raft of reforms, the Norgrove reforms, because the system was taking far too long and children can't wait. 
If you have a child who is nine months of age when the care proceedings start and you don't complete the case for a year, the child is um, developmentally a different creature. So the 26 weeks was a necessary, and it's only a target. In many, many cases, it's not achieved. It's only the ideal. And the adoption proceedings will be subsequent to the care proceedings. The care proceedings are a necessary precursor. And again, even in adoption proceedings, children, if they're in limbo, deserve to be put into something more permanent as soon as possible. So I don't myself feel that it is a well-founded um, concern that the proceedings are um, over-accelerated. I, I think that uh, experience has shown that, um, uh, that the length of any case is essentially dependent upon uh, its own individual facts and circumstances and maybe there will be a need for investigations in another member state which will take the case beyond the 26 week uh, target and I know that the consular representatives in London uh, are always pressing for a more relaxed tempo for cases involving children, members of their own nation state. So maybe we do need to recognize that in any case involving a child who is a member, a national of another, for, uh, another member state, the 26 uh, week target should be relaxed uh, and, and that there should be uh, a greater margin of appreciation in those cases. So uh, I think I'm coming round to agreeing with you. <laughs> thank you. And now, yes, thank you, Mr. Yarish. Ja też chciałem podziękować za pytania. Są one bardzo ciekawe. Thank you for those questions. Very interesting uh, questions. And by way of response, I'd like to go back to what I think is the most important thing, namely an international document, the uh, Convention of uh, the Rights of the Child, which is based on two principles, the first being the protection of childhood and of rights accruing from that, the second being helping the family the, the state helping the family, given that so the family is the natural de place of development for a child. I'm very proud of this document because it came about as a result of Polish initiative and is based on the world, uh, world renowned. Uh, Polish educator that prepared the philosophical basis of it. And uh, the, 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 this idea of cooperation is central to it. Now, as to whether cooperation between member states uh, is sufficient, I don't think that is the case. Although the convention is ratified by almost all of the world's countries, Let's not forget that, uh, that there are a few countries that have expressed reservations regarding adoption, rights of the child, right to legal uh, presence and so on. Regarding treatment of the family, that uh, varies from country to country. And how can we make sure that uh, the that the prote social protection system isn't superseded here? Now, 
The idea here is that you could take children away from a family for economic reasons. I think that is unacceptable. If there is uh, an economic problem in the family, then you need to find ways of helping the family. And uh, I, I've said this uh, using practical examples. Sometimes uh, children have been taken away from families because of poverty within the family. And then we've had to step in. And it's turned out that it it's, has been possible to improve the family's economic outlook. Even local authorities, uh, the local mayor, for example, were able to help the family to improve their daily living standards by building a bathroom, for example. There are certain standards that uh, we need to adhere to. And all signatories to the convention um, need to be aware of that. I think we need to have lots of forums, lots of meetings in Europe to talk about the way to best safeguard the essential rights of children. And there's another uh, right that we don't often talk about, namely the child's identity, the, the child's right to his or her own identity. In terms of plenary adoption, well, it's easy to say that the child doesn't have the right to uh, find out their own biological origins. We've talked about this for many years in Poland and we've seen at the end of the day and we've decided that the Polish state must not uh, destroy the documents regarding the child's origin. And each child uh, from the age of 18 above can look at their records and find out about their origins. That's a, a, a right, not a duty. You can't, you shouldn't destroy a human being's roots. And I think that each country should think about that. The Polish solution may well be a good one, although that's open to debate. There may well be better solutions or similar ones. And then to return to another question, from what age should you seek the child's opinion? Well, to be succinct, all children those children. For example, a disabled child should a disabled child not be heard because they have problems putting across their opinion. Well, that child should be uh, protected. We have uh, uh, comments from the. Uh, Committee on Rights of the Child. There are 16 points there. And they say that there aren't, there shouldn't be problems uh, interpreting a, ch a child even if they can't talk. There is uh, eye contact, body language, there are experts that can decode that language. And then there's another problem. Should we take into account the child's opinion? Uh, I'm just wrapping up, Chair. The, uh, a 13-year-old child has an opinion and uh, says that they, uh, whether they, that they, they're able to say whether they agree with adoption or not. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to Madam Wickstrom, Sir Matthew Sorp and Mr. Yarosh. If I may summarise um, some of the points and, and in one minute to say that I mean, there's a huge sensitivity about this issue generally, about adoption, because member states have had different and difficult experiences, my own in particular, and I invite colleagues to look at the Irish experience and how we're now dealing with things that happened 
20, 30, 40, 50 years ago and to warn other member states to avoid these problems. The second issue is the need for greater cooperation at judicial level and I very much appreciate the comments of Sir Matthew that things are improving and, and will improve further. Um, the need to keep the child at the centre and how difficult that is um, in order to hear the child and to reflect its interests. And then to look at the family and very poignantly, Mr. Yarosh, your issue about making sure we don't remove children for economic reasons so that there is a social engineering by accident around this very sensitive issue. Uh, and lastly, to say that um, here in the Parliament we've had excellent cooperation from my office with petitions and with the legal affairs. And I think we all, as human beings, apart from politicians, struggle with this issue. But we do want to make sure that we voice these problems in the European Parliament and help find solutions where we can recognising subsidiarity and other sensitivities, but that we're here to assist in this very difficult process. So my thanks to you all and my colleagues for contributing to the debate and for allowing me to chair this really important uh, event this afternoon. And I now happily hand over for the next session to our chairman, Mr. Schwifka. Thank you. Bardzo dziękuję pani przewodniczącej Magines. Dziękuję. Thank you, dear Ms. McGuinness. And I'd like to thank our three speakers. This exchange of views has been very interesting. We have seen how high emotions are in terms of resolving these problems. And we move on now to the second part of the workshop. And this deals with uh, recognition of um, cross-border adoptions. There are many aspects pertaining to the family, so we're now going to focus on the status of the family, the definition of the family in different member states, on the approach to the rights and obligations surrounding the family. First, we turn to Gianpaolo Romano from Geneva University, who is going to talk uh, about these uh, initial aspects. Thank you, Chair. I would like to thank the European Parliament for its generous invitation to a professor from a Swiss uh, university, although I do have Italian nationality too. So it's a, a privilege to be here. I'd like to express my thanks to Celine Chateau, who uh, was responsible for inviting me and for her uh, trust and her guidance. We're here to talk about, I've been asked here to talk about family situations, even beyond adoption. Now, situation means lots of things, so I prefer to talk about family status rather than situation. Now, family status is usually conferred on two persons by an authority, an administrative or court authority, in marriage, registered partnership, or else you can have the suppression or the removal of a prior status in divorce or disavowal of paternity. Adoption, which we're dealing with today, often involves two steps. The uh, paternity is removed from the biological parent and conferred on the adoptive parent. Now, as you say, Chair, a statute is defined by the uh, totality of the legal effects it produces in terms of public law, nationality, uh, family uh, reunions, and private law, which are contractual uh, rights uh, entered into by the new parent, or the matrimonial regime, which is brought about by marriage, or paternity rights, for example, between the child and the parent. Now, as of now, there is no European instrument on international competence to confer family status or laying down rules on the creation or uh, recognition of status 
on the recognition of marriages or a registered partnership or paternity resulting from an adoption or a judicial uh, recognition of paternity. There are only two regulations regarding the removal of a status, divorce and annulment, and that's Brussels 2A and Rome 3, which is in force in only just half of the member states of the EU. So this uh, legislative timidity, if I may term it thus, in the European Union with regard to the creation of family status is in contrast with the large number of regulations which we'll be adopting in terms of the effects that flow from a status, for example, maintenance obligations, uh, succession, or soon to be the case, uh, matrimonial regimes, and uh, as regards uh, paternity, including adoptive paternity, the rights and ob obligations of paternity are covered by Brussels 2A in terms of competence and recognition of judgments and from the Hague Convention 1996 in terms of the applicable law. To summarise, a member state is as of now free uh, at the request of the parties concerned, or one of them, to confer a family status which in other member states is also free not to recognise. But this dual freedom is likely to generate a conflict of family statuses uh, in terms of uh, limping uh, or half-baked marriage or adoption and so on. Take a case, an example, Mr. Dupont, French, and Mr. Bianchi, Italian. Now in France, uh, uh, France can make it the marriage for all available to whom it wishes, so the two can marry in France, but Italy is similarly free in terms of Italian public policy to deny recognition of that marriage, that is to refuse to register it in the Italian uh, civil register uh, pertaining to Mr Bianchi, who remains unmarried therefore from the point of view of Italy. So what are the consequences of this Franco-Italian uh, disagreement in terms of the civil status of the two individuals who are married in France but not married in Italy? So in, from the Italian perspective, Mr. Bianchi has no maintenance obligations because he's not the spouse of Mr. Dupont. But in France, Mr. Bianchi is under an obligation to uh, maintain Mr. Dupont because he's his spouse. So if Mr. Dupont gets a French judgment ordering Mr. Bianchi to pay him maintenance, Mr. Bianchi can ask the Italian authorities to reverse that decision, refusing to enforce, therefore, the French judgment. Why? Because Italian public policy is opposed to the recognition of the French marriage, it can also refuse to recognize, flowing from that, a French judgment based on the status of spouse, which is not recognized in Italy. And therefore, the Italian, Franco-Italian conflict in terms of status will have generated a Franco-Italian conflict in terms of maintenance obligations. As we speak, is there, there is no legal means in the European Union to resolve a conflict of judgments between two member states. The Luxembourg Court, the Court of Justice, hasn't got such a power. So the conflict will ultimately be resolved because war never goes on forever, fortunately, but the resolution of the conflict will not be a legal one. It could be uh, brought about by private justice, the law of, this more, of the stronger, or the quicker, or the smarter. M Mr. Bianchi, for example, could move all his assets from France to Italy to avoid enforcement of the French uh, judgment on maintenance. Now, if Mr. Bianchi was to die intestate, then there could be a conflict between Mr. Dupont, who in French eyes is uh, the heir uh, to Mr. Bianchi, and the uh, uh, siblings in Italy of Mr. Bianchi, who would also see themselves as entitled to the um, estate of their brother, because uh, Mr. Bianchi is not in Italy the spouse of Mr. Dupont. Finally, imagine Dupont and Bianchi have adopted in France uh, a child of Senegalese origin, the biological child of Madame Mbenge, who initially consented to the adoption and then changed her mind. 
Now, Italy can refuse to recognize this adoption under the, because the Hague Convention of 1993 is not applicable to that uh, scenario. And then when, when Mr. Bianchi dies, there can be, could be a conflict uh, of custody between uh, Mbengue and Dupont. From the French perspective, the, uh, and France has uh, uh, legitimated the adoption, it is Mr. Dupont who is the parent, whereas under Italian law, Madame Mbengue has never ceased to be the legal parent because the French adoption is not recognised in Italy. Now, such situations are obviously contrary to the objective of creating a f space of uh, freedom, justice and security because justice is being denied to the individuals who are victims of these intra-European conflicts on status. And one of the uh, freedoms, the founding freedoms of the European Union is uh, undermined. Uh, unity and diversity is the slogan of the European Union, but in this case France and Italy are not united despite uh, the uh, diversity of their concept of marriage, they are in click victims. And y you will agree that it's good to encourage uh, legal pluralism, which is a mark of uh, freedom and a source of progress, but it's different to uh, create and maintain legal conflicts. That's a failure of law, it's a capitulation of law, and a return to a state of nature. Now, we know the distinction between religious pluralism, which is a good thing, and religious conflict, which is to be avoided, which leads me to suggest some pathways to improve uh, European family life for the citizens and residents of the Union. In the note I prepared, I envisage four pathways, and I don't have time to uh, detail them all, but I'd like to mm -hmm. present them briefly. Uh, first approach would be for the EU to continue to authorize member states to create a family status while allowing other member states not to recognize it. But in terms of the effects, the European Union would order each member state to uh, recognize this status or to give effect to the status which is uh, applicable in the relevant member state. For example, France might celebrate a marriage between Dupont and Bianchi, and Italy could refuse to register this in the Italian civil register. So that status quo would remain in that respect. But if the law applicable to uh, maintenance is French law, then Italy would apply the status that Mr. Dupont and Bianchi have in France and would consider them married for maintenance purposes. Italy would also lose the option of not enforcing a French judgment ordering Mr. Bianchi to pay maintenance. But if the law applicable to succession of Mr. Bianchi was Italian law, then France would have to uh, go along with the uh, non-spousal status of Mr. Dupont in Italian eyes. So it would be sort of variable geometry status, uh, semi-status. So for some effects, Dupont Bianchi would be spouses in France and in Italy, and for other effects, the two would be non-spouses, both in France and also in Italy. The second option is much more uh, far-reaching, I fear, or invasive. It would require imposing on each member state to systematically recognize any family status conferred by any other member state. So an adoption ordered in the United Kingdom where two, uh, the two adoptive mothers were a Bulgarian and a Pole living in England and Britain, that would be binding on Bulgaria and Pol Poland, who couldn't uh, rely on public policy to refuse it, or to stay topical if a German citizen uh, used a surrogate mother in Greece and uh, obtained an order from the Greek authorities... Uh, to that effect, that status, if it was validly created in Greece, would be binding on the German authorities who would have to register it in the uh, German civil register. That would be a major change. It would be revolutionary. And for this innovation to be acceptable, it would uh, mean that the... Uh, uh, the European Union would have to uh, list the uh, uh, obligations in question to discourage uh, tourism, uh, matrimonial tourism or adoptive or procreative tourism. Now, the third pathway 
would be to bring the authorities of two or more member states together in a procedure of co-decision making or cooperation. This would be similar to what you find under the Hague Convention of 1983, which uh, Ms. Martinez is going to talk to us in more detail about. And this uh, would have the two member states work together. They would be required to coordinate their positions so that when the adoption is ordered, it would almost be a binational decision following a bi-state procedure, a transnational procedure because the two states would have contributed to the decision, the state of residence of the child and of the adoptive parents. Now, in terms of surrogate uh, motherhood, the pathway would mean that before ordering uh, or uh, authorising uh, surrogacy in Greece, the, the Greek authorities have to conduct the uh, German uh, authorities where the, the uh, prospective uh, adoptive mother comes from. So they would have to coordinate the positions and in my note I discussed the various solutions that would be available in that scenario. Now just very quickly, uh, the fourth uh, pathway one may dream, and this would be to draw up a substantive law of the European Union for the conferring or the removal of family status, which would be optional. We wouldn't replace the national laws of the member states and the diversity of member state law, but it might be and should be accompanied by the creation of European authorities whose job would be to administer it, of European civil status officers who would be entitled to celebrate European marriage, European courts which could uh, uh, order a European adoption and this the status that were conferred in that way would be binding in all the member states. It would be uh, fully formed and it would no, be no longer a question of mutual recognition or refusal of recognition Recognition. And I might make a parallel with another area, uh, quite a distant, uh, remote area, that of patents and intellectual property. Uh, as some of you will know, there is going to be a European uh, patents uh, court coming into being with a central chamber in Paris and two other chambers, one in uh, London and one in Munich. And there'll be regional uh, Chambers too, one in Stockholm for the Nordic area and a local one in Italy. So the European uh, patent uh, will be issued by the author European authorities and will be effective throughout all the member states. But this uh, European patent won't be replacing the national patents but will be uh, supplementing them. So it won't replace a national law on national patents. And in terms of family uh, law, it, it would obviously be more laborious and complicated than uh, in the area of patents. It would something, be something that would have to be done gradually in a few pilot areas. I, I wonder why uh, adoption mightn't be a good pilot area for that. Now, obviously, this solution like the other ones I've mentioned, might seem unachievable. But since the uh, Treaty of Amsterdam, the uh, European Union has made huge progress compared to what was thought achievable at the time. And a lot of what was thought impossible has become a reality today for the benefit of European citizens and residents. Thank you. Bardzo dziękuję, panie profesorze. Thank you, professor. Thank you for looking at this issue from a new angle. I think that during our Q&A session we will refer back to what you have said. I would just say that these problems you mentioned are not just Franco-Italian problems. They could relate to other member states of the European Union. I agree that it's going to be very difficult to harmonize legislation in this area because substantive family law is not a competence of the European Union. We deal with procedural law more in the European Union. When it comes to Rome 3, we made it possible for uh, both parties 
to protect the weaker partner in a partnership, not the cleverest or the quickest. So when it comes to such procedures, we don't take account of the swiftness of procedures. But when it comes to your proposal, your patent like proposal, well, when it comes to room three, uh, enhanced cooperation applies. So not all member states would be involved as a matter of course. I do think that we need to dream. Dreams are important. And we'll talk about that during the discussions. But before that, we're going to hear from Mrs. Martinez Mora, who is the Prince of National Law. We've mentioned this uh, convention on a number of occasions today. It's an international convention that protects children in, within the framework of international adoptions. And I think that this should enable us to think about new, innovative and effective solutions. But let's hear about the situation vis-à-vis -vis this convention. Over to you. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Por una vez. Thank you very much, Chair. I'll speak uh, Spanish for a change. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honour for me to be here today in this uh, expert hearing on adoption on behalf of uh, the Hague uh, Convention on International Private Law. I'd like to thank you for this invitation. It's very important for me, particularly bearing in mind what we've heard previously regarding cooperation between our institutions. It's very important for us. In my presentation this afternoon, I will be focusing on three topics. Firstly, I'll be talking a little bit about the Convention, its scope, its objectives, and the signatory states. Secondly, I'll be talking a little bit about an automatic recognition, its effects, um, strengths, and challenges. And then to wrap up, I'll look at a few ideas for the future. <coughs> Judge uh, Jaros has already set out a little bit uh, about the scope of the Hague Convention, so I'm not going to go into that again. Just to say that the important thing uh, is habitual residence of the child as well as the prospective adoptive family. Uh, nationality isn't a criterion to decide whether an adoption is national or international, but what's important is that although, uh, for example, I'm Spanish, my husband's Italian, we live in the Netherlands, and we want to adopt uh, a child from Lithuania, the authorities of the Netherlands, because that's where we live, that's where our work is, that's where our friends are, and the Lithuanian authorities will deal with the adoption. But if we want to do things properly, we will also have to get in touch with the Spanish authorities and with the Italian author authorities before going through with the adoption to find out what will happen in regards to nationality. So the nationality isn't regulated upon in the Hague Convention, but there is good practice. And we have learned from the mistakes of the past. So one of the recommendations is to watch out. If uh, you have that kind of international adoption, then all those uh, countries have to be involved. Turning to the objectives of the Convention, one of the important points for me is that our Hague Conventions norm uh, normally have very long uh, titles. The 93 one it's very significant. It's quite a short title here. It's to do with the protection of, char of children, which is important because people often talk about adoption. It's a convention on the protection of children, as uh, came out in the f first ses session this afternoon. That's very important. And then the convention is to do with cooperation. We want member states to cooperate, to communicate, to talk together, to avoid problems. Now looking at what the Convention does. It sets out minimum standards for 
adoption of children. We've had many examples this afternoon. An example is the consent of the biological family or the authorities that have to give that consent. This consent must be freely given. It needs to be an informed choice without uh, remuneration. It has to be given in writing. And uh, it's also been said how important it is to keep the information on adoption. Be that's important be because when the adopted children get older, they might need to know about it and, and get answers. Also, subsidiarity of international adoption. And then what's very important is we've heard about the importance of listening to the child allowing the child to give their opinion on adoption. So what the convention does is set out minimum guarantees, basic guarantees. For example, the mother may give consent to adoption only following birth of the child. It's not said whether it, how long, whether it's a minute, 10 days, 10 months, it can always be dealt with at any stage. The, the uh, convention is very flexible because with minimum standards it means that each each signatory state can regulate according to its own legislation and it, uh, it takes into account diversity which is so important. The second objective of the convention is to avoid abuse including child traf trafficking. Unfortunately there are there is a lot of abuse linked to adoption and that is because money changes hands. When money changes hands, that you get problems. I've already mentioned the third objective: having official channels for cooperation. We know who we so we know who we're talking to. We know who's on the other side in the other country. Um, we know who to uh, ask our questions of. If all of those guarantees are respected, then and only then. Uh, do you get automatic recognition? This automatic recognition is given in the 95 signatory states of the convention. We're almost up to 100. And uh, 96 in a few days' time, hopefully, including, as we've heard, 28, the 28 <coughs> EU member states. There are three further countries, which are Russia, Nepal and Korea, who have signed but not yet ratified <coughs> the convention. 95 is an important number, particularly because all uh, reception countries are, are signatories, increasing numbers of origin countries, 75. And it's important that Africa, which has come up previously, that's known as the new frontier for international uh, adoption, because here we've seen that countries are imposing limits. What we're talking about regarding the UK, they want children to stay with their families in their countries. They uh, are doing a lot of work there and they are saying that countries can supply a national uh, response. So there's a desperate search for other countries where children can be adopted from. And that's often done in uh, Africa, but Africa is waking up to this and there are already 16 uh, signatory states that have decided to sign up to the convention. There are many other countries, that, as we will talk about in the third session, that don't have adoption, so they obviously are not part of the convention. You need to be realistic. If you look at the number 95 signatory states, that sounds like a lot, but you need to look at the percentage of adoptions uh, nationally, internationally speaking. Now, the reality uh, is that only about 6% of adoptions carried out globally fall under the Hague Convention. That is because we still have 40-35% of adoptions falling outside because they're carried out with countries that uh, do not sign up to the convention but the uh, percentage will go up gradually those signatory states that aren't part of the convention are Russia, Ethiopia, Korea and Ukraine 
Uh, we went to Korea recently and they have signed up to interest in signing the convention. The same for Russia too. So hopefully uh, that margin will decrease as time goes on. Moving on to the technical side of things for today. What's automatic recognition? Well, as I said, automatic rec recognition depends on the guarantees of the convention being respected. So you don't need a procedure for recognition. You don't need enforcement. You don't need to register the adoption to get it automatically recognized. You don't need to readopt to make things easier. Member states uh, that are part of the convention have set up a model form that many of them already use. Looking at the effects of this adoption, well, there are three. Firstly, uh, you get a bond between the parent and child. Secondly, the, the responsibility of the parents is, is established. Thirdly, there is a, a break of pre-existing parental bond with the child if the adoption uh, leads to that in, in uh, the target country. This is a full adoption. It's important to mention that, I think. There's a difference between full adoptions and simple adoptions. The two are covered by the convention as long as there is a parental bond. That's important because we saw in the first session uh, how many countries uh, are looking at the importance of supporting biological families. Increasingly, you get older children. So maybe in the future, we need to see whether open adoptions where there's some kind of link to the family of origin uh, could be something to look at. So that's uh, an open question that we should be thinking about to see whether that could be an option for the future. There's also been talk about non-recognition, refusal of recognition, and it's very important because that can only happen if the adoption is obviously in, uh, contrary to public order, public policy, uh, uh, and is against the interest of the child. So that's what you need to take into account. Refusal of re re recognition is only for serious breaches when the fundamental rights of the biological family have been um, violated. If there's been uh, a, a theft of a child or another similar crime. And here I would like to put that uh, I would like to look at how many refusals of recognition that there are. I have asked around and I've heard that there are very few true cases of refusal of recognition. That's only done in exceptional cases. To conclude, what does the convention bring us? We've got a, a, a clear, uh, rapid procedure. It's very simple with lower costs. We get legal certainty and signatory states, uh, not me, consider this to be one of the greatest successes of the convention. There are also challenges, of course. Not everything is rosy. But regarding recognition, we do need to work in some countries regarding quali quality of certificates, but more importantly, because this is to do with several mem European member states, in various U European states, there is an additional procedure for recognition, so recognition is not automatic. Obviously, that applies in the face of the Hague Convention, and that needs to change. Uh, the law needs to change in those countries. Well, what can we do? The Hague Convention or the uh, permanent office if there are breaches or problems. Firstly, we, we don't have a body to supervise. We don't have a court to, to, to supervise practical implementation, but we do have other ways of looking at breaches or problems. We stress, given that we're a small uh, organisation, uh, we, we stress trying to deal with the problems. 
we every few years we meet all the countries that are members and or want to be members of the convention and we look at recommendations for the future that's where for example you can talk about uh, innovations and various problems that arise in applying the convention and to conclude the third part what's the current situation well adoptions fall, fall under the convention there are more and more convention members and to try and improve the application of the convention what we try and do is assist uh, the, the, the signatories, give them technical assistance, that's important, and then there are adoptions that fall outside the convention. For those international adoptions that take pl place outside the convention, from the Hague Convention, what we want to do is make sure that uh, there is impetus for countries to sign up because it's a global convention. That can be done by means of technical assistance. That's worked in the past. And then for other more sensitive issues, at the special committee meetings, there are discussion topics that arise because they're, 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 there's an important thing that the convention did in '93 with a, a company that had certain points of view. From '93 onwards, things have changed, and the Hague Convention should be considered a living instrument whose interpretation changes with time, and that interpretation can change. Where, with the agreement of all uh, members. That's important. Uh, the convention members need to agree. And what's happening with international adoptions, our topic for today? I, 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 with international adoptions, there are a number of problems that, uh, uh, that, that, that we only saw in the international uh, adoptions. We see in national ones as well. There's no recognition, for example. But I would call upon the EP to look at this as a global problem, not just a European problem. It's a worldwide problem. So if we've got a worldwide problem, we need a worldwide solution. Because even though we may well have dealt with this at European level, we'll see in the, in the next few years with migration and so on, that the same problem will keep cropping up. So. My humble proposal here would be, well, why don't the various countries of the EU get together to put, to put this topic to the Hague Convention, this issue of recognition of national, uh, national adoptions when there's a foreign element, and to take that discussion global to get a global solution. We have the 93 Convention as a source of inspiration. There's one from 65 as well that will give us uh, things to think about and we can uh, learn from the successes and challenges and try and get the right solution in the interest of the charge. But I think that idea would be realistic and it could uh, be successful. We've got an expert network, we've got practice and if I may say so, it wouldn't be particularly controversial At the Hague Convention, we're also looking at uh, the parental bond and surrogate's uh, maternity. That is very controversial. But, uh, uh, recognition of national adoption, we've done a lot of work there, and that should be easier. So that's a call to parliamentarians to look at that proposal and carry on cooperating and collaborating with us. Thank you. Bardzo dziękuję, pani Martinez Mora. I... Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to have a quick discussion now. We are 17 minutes behind. We have to catch up. So I suggest we do discuss the two presentations by Mrs. Romano and Mrs. Martinez Mora. Anybody have any comments? Petria? Just a very quick question because of the pressure of time. Talking about adoption without consent of the parents. If I understand you rightly, in, in 
national adoptions, it's not possible. But perhaps in national adoptions, because my impression correct? And my naive, uh, second question is, do you think it's a good thing we in the Petitions Committee deal with uh, things, in, including adoption without consent of the parents? Is that compatible with the Hague Convention or not, from your point of view? Bardzo dziękuję, Peter. To rzeczywiście nie, niezwykle wa ważne. Thank you very much, Peter. That's a very important issue. And I would add another question. If all member states have ratified the 1993 Convention, could we take as a starting point could we perhaps think about having a common procedure in the European Union when it comes to adoption my question is for Mr. Mr. Romano at the moment it's very difficult to have a unified family code or family law. My question is, what could we do in order to improve this situation and to regulate it at uh, uh, EU level? Thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Donc, bon, concernant la question au sujet de l'adoption, je me permettrai juste de dire que... On the subject of uh, adoption, uh, I would say that we shouldn't confuse inter-country adoption with international adoption. Taking the point raised by Sir Matthew Thorpe, uh, where a Slovak child was habitually resident in the UK, then under the International Convention, they had to get in contact with the authorities and so on. But that's not an inter-country adoption because the child was in the state of residence where the adoption application was made. So you mustn't confuse uh, inter-country adoption with international adoption. Secondly, uh, Ms. Martinez can uh, give you further details. But I'd like to reply to the, the Chair's question. Recommendations. Now, it's very difficult to uniform to make uniform family law if you want to harmonize it that would the harmonization wouldn't replace national law that's a very important point some years ago a european regulation on international uh, sales didn't replace a uh, french sales law or italian or polish or lithuanian sales law it supplemented it as a european instrument and i think that a couple a franco german or franco lithuanian or franco polish or franco spanish couple uh, will soon have the right to have to a european marriage rather than a mononational uh, or binational marriage i think that is the future now Staying in the present, I think we must avoid at all costs uh, regulatory chaos in terms of the rights and obligations of parties which cannot be resolved legally. That would be a return to the law of the jung uh, jungle. We're all lawyers here, so we have to avoid a situation where people getting into an international law situation don't have the right to know what their rights are, what the rights are that they may exercise and what obligations they must comply with. I think that's a, a self-evident truth. But first we have to be, I think half the battle is to recognize what the problem is and I think that that, that much is done. Now, I think what we need today is to allow member states uh, for some, continue for some years to create its all uh, uh, family law statuses, uh, homosexual marriage, things like that, uh, and allow another member state not to recognize it. But in terms of the effects of those statuses, the applicable law, to, uh, law of maintenance uh, and so on, uh, where the various regulations are applicable uh, that have entered into force. In that case, uh, then member states are, can remain in conflict in terms of civil status, but in terms of the effects of the civil status, we should prevent them entering into conflict. Now, 
for some years, uh, it still won't be a practical solution. But in five years, in ten years, I'm looking at the young people here. There's some young people around the room. I'm wondering if they don't think that today it's not really acceptable that in Europe, uh, to mention, you mentioned divorce, a divorce uh, ordered in Sweden between a Swedish man and an Irish woman might not be recognised in Ireland so that the divorce within the European Union isn't really working because in Ireland uh, the two women would st- or the man and the woman still be married whereas in Sweden uh, not. So we need a reciprocal recognition of status. I think it poss- will be possible down the road in a few years' time. Dziękuję i pani Martinez Mora, proszę. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you very much. Well, Ali will read out Article 4, C1 of the Convention, which uh, deals with the issue of consent. The Hague Convention says that all people, institutions and authorities whose consent is required for the adoption uh, must be uh, properly assessed and they must be informed of the consequences of the consent. So, the Hague Convention sets out minimum requirements. It doesn't say who has to give their consent. That is up to national law. Each country will decide when the, fi- the, the family, when the uh, biological mother needs to be consented, that doesn't. The, the biological mother must be informed and proper, properly uh, advised. That's something that we've seen giving uh, technical assistance to many countries. The biological mother, when she is properly informed. Uh, properly advised and uh, properly supported and she's told what the various possibilities are of finding work, for example, how to uh, get organised. Uh, not for a month, but for a, a longer time period. So that gives you the possibility for the, the mother to keep the child or give their consent in, in an informed way as opposed to being in... Uh, a kind of shock situation where you just want to, to give your agreement to something that you haven't thought through properly, but that is very important that the, the convention has the need to for uh, information and uh, advice. Bardzo dziękuję. Przechodzimy zatem do. Thank you very much. We can now move on to our next subject. I want to talk about domestic adoptions and recognition thereof. Obviously, now that there is more free movement or free movement within countries, I'm going to ask Mrs. Ruth Cabeza to give us a presentation on this subject. She is a specialist in family law. She's a member of an international association of family lawyers. So I think that's going to be very important in terms of our discussion. Over to you, madam. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak to you. It's an enormous honour. Um, I start with my key findings in my paper. And I think one of the things which is really important to begin with is that there is currently no mechanism within the EU which provides for the obligatory recognition and enforcement of domestic adoption orders within other member states. And I think it's important to take that as our starting point because, as I understood from our very first speaker, the um, view is that no additional regulation is required because we already have the 1993 Convention of which all member states are a member. And so there appears to be a perception that inter-country adoption in its most broad sense is not a problem because of the effects of the Convention. But as some of my um, learned speakers have already pointed out, um, the devil is in the detail in terms of what is the definition of an inter-country adoption. And an inter-country adoption is one where the adopters live in one country and the child lives in another country. And so the inter-country aspect is the child and the adopters not living in the same place. It is not to do with nationality. 
a domestic adoption, certainly under uh, English law, is not um, governed by the habitual residence of the child, nor by the habitual residence of the adopters, nor even by the nationality of the, adoption, the adopters. It is perfectly possible under English law for a judge to um, make an adoption order concerning a child who lives in a different member state by, the adop by um, adopters who live in the same domestic state as the child, uh, the same foreign state as the child. So, for example, let's imagine that there is um, an English domiciled person, so a person who has England as their permanent home, temporarily living in France, married to a French person, and between them they decide to adopt a French child living in France, they could apply to the English court to make that adoption order. So the English court has the jurisdiction under domestic law to make an order concerning a French child living in France where one of the adopters is France and French and one of the adopters is a British national still domiciled in England. So that order would have effect under English law, but it would not necessarily need to be automatically recognised by the French authorities. So what I have been thinking about in my paper is really should there be some kind of regulation of recognition? And if there should be recognition, how should that come about? What should be the circumstances under which uh, recognition would be granted? Should it be automatic? Should it be under a um, procedure if it should happen at all? So if we have a look, I mean, in my paper, and I'm not going to go through it now because we are running late, but in my paper I do talk about the effects of the European Convention on the Adoption of Children, which sets out minimum expectations and has only been taken up by ten members of Europe. The um, difficulties of there not being recognition, I think, have been touched upon by um, Mr. Parlow, because you have the statuses not being recognised, that can bring citizens having uncertainty as to their tax duties, their inheritance duties, their um, exercise of parental responsibility, if that parental responsibility flows only from an adoption order. Because there is lack of clarity, I think, in Brussels 2 BIS. Brussels 2 BIS says that it does not relate to adoption orders because they deal with the attribution of parenthood. But obviously one thing that happens with parenthood is the attribution of parental responsibility. But if a country doesn't recognise an adoption order, why will they have to recognise the parental responsibility that only flows from the adoption order? Without the adoption order, there is no parental responsibility. So in my paper I have uh, a made-up situation which is probably attributable to the fact that I don't know enough about the individual law of adoption throughout the year and I don't want to offend anybody. But within that we see a potential problem where if you are required to have parental responsibility and you are an adoptive parent and your child is with you in a foreign country in Europe and requires medical treatment, are you able to give that? Now, perhaps the issue won't arise in practice very often because when you adopt a child, you usually get um, a, new, a replacement birth certificate. The child will have a passport with the family name usually. And so a doctor may not know the difference between a child who is an adopted child or a child who is a natural child. So the question may never arise. But, but it may arise if it's, for example, two male parents who are seeking to exercise parental responsibility, or two female parents, or parents where there is a clear ethnic um, digression between their background and the child's background. 
in which case these questions may come to be asked on a practical level. And so there is, I think, um, a real practical imperative uh, which urges us to think how can we resolve these difficulties of status for our citizens. So the solutions which um, I have thought through um, in terms of how might things be um, brought about, the questions that I think that need to be asked, I find the part of my talk. Uh, sorry. Uh, these, and these I think are the, the main questions that I'd like to leave you with to think about. Should there be automatic recognition by all member states of adoption orders made in accordance with the domestic law governing adoption in the member state which made the adoption order? That is the most radical um, solution and it is the one that it would be most controversial because it would oblige member states whose moral and ethical codes would prohibit recognition of particular types of adoption, for example, same-sex adoption. Um, they would, there would be no way around recognition for that. So another alternative, um, the, next, the, the next down in terms of draconianness would be automatic recognition of adoption orders made under the domestic law of a member state limited to those made by a member state in relation to a child who is habitually resident in that member state and or a citizen of that member state. Now that would echo the habitual residence qualification, would perhaps echo the 1993 convention on intercountry adoption where the state responsible for making the decisions for the child is the state in which the child lives. And obviously in a, in a domestic adoption, if the adopters are also living in the same country as the child, um, that will be the same, you would expect that to be the country um, of the child's habitual residence most often as well. And so if the child and the Adopters are both habitually resident in one member state and that member state makes a convention order, should that be automatically recognised throughout Europe rather than an adoption order which perhaps doesn't require the habitual residence of the child. And if the child's a citizen of a different country to the country of their habitual residence, should that country have any involvement in it? Then we could say, well, Perhaps the adoption order should only be recognised if the member state of the child's place of habitual residence has agreed that the adoption should proceed in advance of the final adoption being granted in circumstances where the member state seized with the adoption application is not the member state in which the child is habitually resident. This goes back to the example I gave of the French, um, the child living in France with a mother who is domiciled in England. So if the English court was thinking of making that order and the French authorities had agreed that the order should proceed, would people feel, well, that's an adoption order that perhaps everybody should um, accept and recognise? Similarly, you, you could bring in the same requirement in relation to citizenship. So it will only be capable of automatic recognition if the country of the child's nationality has given their approval to the adoption going forward. And that, again, could come in with a, a process if there was um, cooperation between central authorities in the same sort of way as there is under the 1993 convention. So if both central authorities agree and the adoption goes ahead under the domestic law because it's not an inter-country adoption, should that be um, a way that we can bridge this gap? Now the downside of that, as I think again um, in, this, in, the, in the talk from Mr. Paolo, is that it would be unlikely that a country, for example, that prohibited um, adoption by a same-sex couple would endorse the adoption proceeding in the other in the state that accepts same-sex adoption. So that might limit the number of adoptions, but the ban, the, on the plus side, there would be a reduction in uncertainty of status for our children. And so there are always prices to be paid for benefits. So that's one way. Um, another um, option 
would be to not require agreement, similarly um, to the 1993 Convention on Intercountry Adoption, but to require consultation and to take into account the views of the other member states. So if an adoption, um, let's say an adoption in England concerned a child who was a citizen of Poland but who was habitually resident in England, the um, Polish Central Authority would have to be notified, given information about the uh, proposed adoption and the adopter's circumstances and the child's circumstances and the reasons why, and given an opportunity to um, consider and then respond to that and have their response taken into account by the English adoption um, judge, but the judge not being bound by it. Now, that would be um, a solution which would be similar to that which we can find in the 1996 Convention on uh, Parental Responsibility. Under Article 33, there has to be um, consultation with the foreign set state if you're looking at making an order. For example, if, if the English courts want to make an order that would give parental responsibility to um, a, a family member living in Australia with a view to the child leaving England and living in Australia, the Australian Central Authority would need to be consulted. And if it was consulted and the orders were then made, the Australian court is bound to recognise and enforce that order for parental responsibility. So there is consultation and sharing of information, but not um, a requirement for formal agreement as <coughs> there is under Article 17 of the 93 Convention. So that is another way that perhaps we could consider giving recognition. And then the last um, idea which occurred to me is that perhaps automatic recognition under any circumstances is going to be too much to ask for having regard to the diversity of uh, approaches to the idea of adoption <coughs> throughout the EU, but perhaps we could have something which was more like um, a recognition. So there would be a process for recognition, but rather than as now having a different law governing recognition of foreign domestic adoptions, we could have one system which all citizens could use and know, well, if I go to this place, I fill out this form, I provide this information, I give the certificate I'll be told, yes, I will recognise it in this country and give effect to it, or no, I won't recognise your adoption and I won't give effect to it. But at least the parents, they wouldn't necessarily always have recognition, but they would have clarity and they would have a um, straightforward and hopefully not onerously expensive or onerously procedural uh, process by which they could clarify for the benefit of their child that child's status while living in a different country in Europe. Because the reality is that people are moving, they are making family connections in different places, they are going from one country to another following job opportunities as and when they arise. And they take their families with them and their children go with them. And it may, I think it probably is an important thing to have certainty for those families and those children as to who can make decisions for them and how those children um, will be seen within their communities um, as they are travelling through Europe. Thank you. Ja również bardzo pani dziękuję. To jest I'd like to thank you too. Uh, that's something that represents a, another big contribution to our discussion. Uh, these are topics which are becoming increasingly complicated. After each speech, I find things are even more complicated than before. But I still think it's very important. The, the main idea, if we're concerned with the well-being of the child, uh, then the legal difficulties are more easily resolved. But apart from the law, 
there's something else which is mutual trust and I think we still have difficulties with that, with mutual trust. When I used to uh, formerly work in a previous job, we had lots of problems because we didn't trust our different legal systems. Now we'll come back to this issue during the discussion because we still have one more expert to speak on a very interesting subject, the whole issue of adoption in Europe. When we talk about it, we forget that there are other countries in the world too, countries where the institution of adoption doesn't exist, but the problems are the same. So, Madame Najma Nasseri, who works in the Max Planck Institute, is going to talk to us about her view of the uh, rules protecting the rights of the child in the uh, Middle East, not uh, adoption and other subjects. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let me take you out of Europe. Our vision is obviously to look into um, adoptions, but no one of us has actually defined adoption. We are using these terms over thousands of years, and the content of adoption has changed and evolved. And it is very important to look into these themes, to go into the substance of the legal structures that we want to recognize, that we want to transfer, that we want to understand, um, to be able to accommodate the different meanings. So we have seen that we have problems in recognizing adoptions, whatever that is, um, from France to Italy, from Italy to Poland, and you can continue with all these countries. And this, I think the focus of attention is too much on the label adoption. I have just looked into the country where I studied law, um, and this is Austria and France and uh, Great Britain. And when you look into the substantive um, definition, you will find that actually we should not ever recognize an Austrian adoption because it's so completely different from the German um, notion of adoption. So we've heard today that adoptions are irreversible. Well, it's not true. It's not always irreversible. There is a revocation of adoption in Austria, in Germany. I just heard also in the UK. Obviously, under very specific conditions, but there is the option of revocation. So the question is, what is adoption? And from the um, uh, research that I've done, and I want to emphasize for all of this, and I think in this parliament very importantly, the importance of comparative law, um, to see how do countries actually understand what adoption is. And from my research, I came up with one essentialia adoptionis, if you like, which, is, um, which has three features. The first feature is, compared to the historical development of adoption, today adoption is not concerned with, mostly not concerned with the, um, as it was in history, with the transfer of uh, a family name or a succession, um, and it is not done primarily between adults, how it was done in, his, in historical perspective. Today, adoption is meant to create, to generate a new legal bond between new parents and a child on a permanent basis, and I understand permanent to be, uh, permanence to be given when that bond does not end with the majority of the child. Um, it has the effect of giving the new parents full parental authority, and I'm using authority as a very traditional term just to convey the feeling that parental authority encompasses different notions again. So you have custody, you have guardianship, you have actually, and when I use full parental authority, I mean every right and duty that exists between a child a biological child and its biological parents. So this would be the second feature. And the third feature is the centrality of the welfare of the child. So the German definition of adoption is adoption is possible only if it's in the interest of the child. This is the first um, sentence on, of, of adoption. It doesn't define adoption in, 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 in very much detail. It just states that important um, uh, principle. So if we have as a first conclusion that we, when we talk of, about adoption, we all 
could mean different things, and we come to a common frame of reference. We just talked about how important communication was. It's true. But when we communicate with the same word and we mean different things, we are actually not really communicating. So um, if we, if we um, settle on these three features, and you can obviously criticize my features, but if we settle on these three features and then we go into um, legal structures that we find in different countries, and my focus is Middle Eastern countries, and we can look into the structures and see whether we can find these three features in that, you will be surprised. And I will give you just two examples because time is short. And I will start with something which is really at the, at the heart of my, of my research, and I really want to bring that out into the public. The kafala is not a substitute for adoption. Kafala is a term which is taken from the law of obligations in Islamic law, and it actually denotes a surety bond, a guarantee, if you want. Okay? It has been taken up only by the countries of North Amer uh, Africa, um, most prominently Tunisia, um, Morocco, Algeria. You can find it in Egypt and Sudan as well. But you do not find it in any other Muslim jurisdiction. And it is important to say that because the idea that there is kafala and there is no adoption is just wrong. Okay? So this is my one very important statement. The second thing is just because we call something kafala, it doesn't mean that it means the same thing in the three countries that I just named, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, because the the detail, as you said, the details um, are very important. So Tunisian and Morocco kafala ends with the majority of a child. It is not an adoption. It is, if you want, functionally comparable to a foster care arrangement. But the kafala in Algeria does not end with the majority. So this is a very important point. It does not end automatically. So it creates, it is based on the idea of creating a permanent bond. And also, what is important is the notion of parental authority, which under Islamic law, and uh, um, also until uh, a couple of decades in German law, was, was divided in two parts. One is the physical care of somebody, educational, being there, raising that child, and the other one is the management of its assets. And taking this together makes full parental authority in Middle Eastern countries. So under the Algerian kafala, the full parental authority is actually transferred to the kafil, to the person who takes up the kafala. So we already have two very important points in my, in my um, definition of an equivalent surrogate for adoption. And the third point is that in all Middle Eastern countries that we have scanned very quickly, my team and I, in the last weeks, we have found that all these countries have incorporated in the last decades, two or three decades, the principle of the best interest of the child as the, pa as the paramount principle in child law. So we have all three features. And we have to open our eyes that in these countries there are national laws that apply and there is no reference to the Qur'an or to the Hadith or what the Prophet did in the desert. And I want to emphasize that because there is so much misconception about the laws in these countries. Now the problem that we have in Algeria, and this is the, this is, there is only one way to solve that problem, is that the pers uh, Code of Person Status in Algeria has an article which, which, say, which says in the tra uh, translation, adoption is prohibited. Now, it is safe to say that on the Algerian law, tabani, which is the Arabic word, is prohibited. That means that any relationship that transfers everything that comes from filiation is prohibited under Algerian law. It does not mean that the legal institution conferring these three features is not allowed in Algerian law. So I'm not saying that I know better than the Algerian uh, lawyers and the legislator, but I'm saying that for the sake of domestic law in Algeria, you have to have a different focus than when you want to recognize a foreign entity in a Western court. You need a broader, a comparative functional view on the legal entity that you are dealing with. And if you do that, you will come to um, the result that you could, as a Western judge, recognize and an Algerian kafala under the scheme of, in particular in France, uh, adoption sam, the simple adoption, which confers exactly the same effects as an Algerian kafala. 
So this is an important view, I think, when we deal with, with notions in general that are foreign to us to question what is the function of that um, notion and what does it serve and why did a legislator actually enact that, um, that uh, legal entity and how do we deal in an international context with, with legal institutions, entities that are completely, that seem completely foreign to us. This is the one, um, uh, one example that I want to bring. And the other example would be uh, the Iraqi law. In Iraqi law, we have not in the personal statute, but in a um, juvenile welfare act, somehow hidden uh, since the uh, um, 1950s, a law that allows for the transfer of parental authority to new parents, the transfer of the name of the new parents to the child, and mandates an obligatory share in the estate of the uh, adopting parents for that child. So you have in Iraqi law a full entity conveying actually full adoption. There is nothing left in that relation that is not the same as in a biological filiation relationship. However, if you look into the ways Western courts and institutions have been dealing with any entity coming from the Middle East, you will see that they have always referred to the Quran or to any Islamic law without having regard to national law. And they have always looked at these countries as being a block. Uh, and it is true there are countries that prohibit tabani, adoption, and they do not provide for equivalence. But then, but then that's a question of that particular country. So what do I suggest? As a comparative lawyer, obviously, I suggest that we have a um, broader look into the subject. We have to understand what adoption means to us, whoever that us is, and we have to see what is adoption coming to us and encompassing. So we need to shift our attention from labels to functions. And um, wherever we find an entity whereby a child can be incorporated into a new family on a permanent basis with full parental care passing to the new parents, the floor is open to investigate further into the specific institution and its potential as an adoption surrogate. And this is always under the, within the frame of the best interest of the child. So, so we need to revi revisit our given ideas on child care and protection in Muslim jurisdictions. We need to overcome the statements, the Bundesamt der Justiz, the German state office that gives its opinion on um, um, uh, on the existence and recognition of foreign adoption, it uses a standard formula for, for decades. It's the same formula in every of their writings, saying that the Quran does not allow for uh, adoption. And just to take this phrase as well, I can tell you in the Quran there is no um, verse on adoption. The only verses that you will find, and everybody in our room will agree, is to say that the child needs to keep its identity. A child shall be called by the name of, of his father. So the right to identity and the importance of genealogy is in there. The second point is to say that the same marriage hindrances that apply to biological descent does not apply to adoptive descent. That means that marriage impediments are caused by biological link that you need a, a hind marriage hindrance between people who are biologically related, but it doesn't tell us that adoption is prohibited. And what was prohibited, prohibited in the seventh century of Islam was actually a completely different legal entity because adoption at that time were done only by adults in the circumstances of alliances between tribes. So I would adopt somebody to bring his welfare and uh, to bring his um, manpower and his, his resources into my clan. This was the reason why adoptions were done. So if we put everything in historical perspective and add the content of what we mean today, this what we mean today is not prohibited by Islam. So even the sentence that the Quran is prohibiting um, adoption is wrong. So having repeated mantra like that adoption is prohibited in all Muslim countries, um, has in, uh, shut away the many facets of child protection measures that exist in Muslim jurisdictions. So if we take a new um, 
comparative approach, we may overcome that. We may also reconsider the terminology that we're using. If you want Middle Eastern countries to adhere to the Hague Convention, we might want to emphasize different wording. Maybe we can you know, add something to it, leave adoption or give a description of adoption or point more to the effects of adoption rather than, than adoption. <laughs> Um, and the last point is, because that has been also put forward, uh, is the consent of the biological parents. Now, we have a di dilemma with that. So we're talking about countries who officially prohibit adoption, or we can say we have countries who prohibit full adoption and have something which is like um, equivalent to it with the weaker um, effects. Now, you can have, under German law, you can have a weak adoption of an Iraqi them, or um, um, recognized that that was uh, performed in Iraq with an Iraqi child. The child has been brought to Germany, and the couple has applied for recognition of that something as a, a German adoption. Now, the court looks into the case and comes and takes my approach and says, let's say, uh, okay, this is a weak adoption. I, I, I just go into the weak adoption part of it. Okay. Now, the parents want to have this weak adoption transferred into a full adoption, which is possible under German law, um, but requires the consent of the parents, the biological parents, probably more probably the mother. So if we, if we take this case, for example, um, in the Iranian case where it's really a weak adoption because Iraqi is a bad example because it's a full adoption, but if we take an equivalent in a Muslim country which is a weak adoption and that prohibits full adoption, and now we say we can transfer it into a full adoption, but we need the consent of the biological mother, and what, what, what does it mean? It means that this woman has to consent to something which is prohibited in her country. Now, she would go to, let's say, the German embassy in Kabul to, have, to give her consent to the transformation of the weak Afghan adoption into a full adoption. The German embassy in Kabul would tell her, I'm sorry, we cannot certify something which is illegal in your country of origin. So even if she wants to give her consent, she cannot give her consent. So if you want to work on the idea of what recognition rules do we have and how do they fill in for countries that prohibit full adoption? We might also want to, to think of that. But I haven't come to a solution because obviously the consent of the mother is important for obvious reasons that we've, we've talked. So just in a nutshell, Islamic law is not what you think Islamic law is. Islamic law is not applied in most Muslim countries except in family law where it is the basis of codified national law. And if we want to talk about recognition of any entity coming from Middle Eastern countries, we need to go into that specific Middle Eastern country and check whether we find what we are looking for. And we can be open with my definition of of adoption, what we're looking for is a permanent bond, full parental care, and the best interest of the child safeguarded. Thank you. Bardzo dziękuję. Rzeczywiście niezwykle interesujące. Thank you. That was a very interesting presentation. The perspective is very interesting because it gives a completely different angle uh, on this problem we've been talking about for a long time and we forget often that there are other systems which may shed some light uh, on the issue. So now it's your last chance to ask questions and to uh, discuss points. If anyone wants to take the floor then you will have it. I see no one asking for the floor. I think we're all happy with the very varied uh, information we've got. We've uh, been overwhelmed with all this information. Uh, we've got our different views on it. I think, however, that the legislative work ahead of us will 
be founded on lots of elements that have come out of your interventions. Let me remind you again that it is the interests of the child that are the purpose of all our work. Now, turning to cooperation between member states, or between member states and third countries, and talking also of cooperation between international organizations, then that uh, all that is a little bit in the background vis-a-vis -vis the interests of the child, but I think there are many elements which help us to improve this situation, which is very disparate in terms of the different cultural, religious, linguistic traditions of the different countries, the, of the country of origin, and then they mustn't forget the definition of the family in some countries. And then there's the issue of adoption by same-sex couples, which isn't recognized in many countries. And there is also the problem of the issue of adoption of the children of parents who are still living, which is different from that where uh, parents have died in an accident or, or otherwise. And all these factors have to be taken into account in the report I've been talking about. I think we will be doing further work on this next year when we will have the uh, draft of Brussels 2A from the Commission and I uh, hope I can use your experience or that you will be contributing your experience in that future legislation. On behalf of the European Parliament and all the MEPs present, I'd like to thank you for coming to Brussels and sharing your experience and your knowledge for which we are grateful and which we will uh, draw on. So thank you once more, and I now close today's session.